so a little over a year ago, I came uh, to the Haskell SG meetup the first time and told about a project of mine that actually came out of the previous work that I spent, I think, two weeks making an API for some web service. And yeah, I, I thought you do it first time, I, it's learning, yeah? You can, you can figure out certain things and even if you could automate it, maybe it's not the best moment. But you do it a second time, that's not learning, so that's not pleasant. And if you do it a third time, and you didn't automate it, and it's a repetitive task, and shame on you as a programmer, yeah? So I didn't do anything second time. And actually, I plan not to write any more JSON uh, disentanglements for a, the API because I don't need it. So I started a JSON autotype project. It was initially quite rewarding, so I, I played with the union types and got basically something that parsed the JSON file and generated Haskell data type out of it, so that the Haskell data type would be serialized to the same structure of JSON and the other way around. And this is the story of how you use it, basically. So I start with something that you, I told like one year ago, so how JSON Autotype works, and then how I used it, and what are probably the things to do next. So one year ago, I, I kind of was very creative about what can I do with it, like maybe servants, uh, auto generation, maybe something else. And now I, I have more concrete vision out of the applications. So the, the, the advantage of the types, everybody knows, it's very comprehensive API description. So nowadays, every documentation of every open source or non-open source project has usually automatically generated documentation that mentions the types of the, all the input variables. If there are no input variable types because the language is rather uh, dynamically typed, then you still quite often annotate it with what should be in, yeah? Then the second, it allows very concise input-output validation. It facilitates a lot of runtime optimizations and allows us to decompose a certain problem domains. That's the theory. The, then you have JSON that is uh, in used basically fragmented, very dynamically typed JavaScript. So there are arrays, there are dictionaries, there are strings, numbers, and booleans, and that's all. And that's used to represent potentially very complicated objects. And it is convenient because it's easily shuttled to the browser from the browser. Even if you have nowadays some uh, program running in Haskell in the browser, it will probably use the JavaScript as kind of virtual machine. So it, it's nice to debug something that is flying in between as a text, as a structured text. Maybe people like me who are very experienced with playing with XML think that it's a bit unwieldy to have a big data structure in XML. And some people that actually work with big structures in XML tend to use um, different kinds of bad words for uh, very, very long documents. <laughs> because as, as you probably know, if you write something as, as XML, it's usually quite a little bit longer, so the next step after writing the, the output or any data structure as XML is usually to compress it so that it goes back to the normal size of the initial text representation. So then the JSON saves us a little bit. There are many uh, other reasons. The, the, the foremost, I would say, is that it's parsable from any language very quickly, and all languages have the parsing libraries including Haskell, there is Ethan. But the problem is with Ethan, you have this representation of the JSON after parsing, and it will, of course, they mention this dynamically typed structure. It, it has no concept of the underlying Haskell types that you want to encode it as. It doesn't check anything. There is a JSON schema, but most people don't use it yet. So what, what do we have? Well, we can translate it, yeah? So basically, if you translate it 
using using as on two JSON and from JSON classes, you translate booleans to booleans, numbers to either ints of the or doubles, so that you don't lose accuracy, or you don't introduce some some extra uh, insignificant digits. Uh, you translate arrays to either vectors or lists, and strings to text, naturally. And the problem starts that uh, Haskell is very strict, uh, so if there is a string, there has to be a string, and maybe we would like to know that certain attributes are missing, so we add maybe types for the values that are absent, or they are null in JSON. For dictionaries, we use uh, the the records because usually, if we have uh, dictionaries that describe authors, they will al always have the attribute name. So we make it strongly typed records. So whenever we will pass a new input that should conform to a similar format as a former input, we will use the same record format, and our software will be robust because it will rely on these statically enforced types. And uh, because uh, JSON has a lot of untagged unions, we introduced the union type that is basically here at the end, this uh, colon bar color or colon pipe colon that works just like Haskell either type. So it's either union of the left A type or right B type, whatever is inside, it, it can be either any of, of the types above. Because normally Haskell tags, or at least Azon tags the, the either type, and we don't want it. We just want to guess. So we try to parse type A. If it fails to parse type A, we parse type B. And this is a simple example. You have a JSON document with color name and hex value. And then basically the, the parser will automatically parse this structure generate the, 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 the parser and generate the validator that checks that the input file conforms to what we expect it to be and makes it uh, a list, uh, a vector of, here is the vector, of records that have either value and name. When we have it, we can, of course, shuttle it in both directions so we can basically assemble at, at the first stage of software development, we can assemble a example requests, like test requests that we generate and those that we accept, and we have types for both of them. This is another example. This is union of two different types of records. So we have either parameters with value, that is integer or boolean, or string. And the JSON auto type will correctly infer these possibilities. And then again, we'll make it a simple data structure. So actually, if you have a very, very long JSON document and you want to discover underlying structure, maybe best way to just put it through JSON auto type and discover it this way. For example, I got quite a few kilobytes of YouTube API and recovered quite comprehensible uh, record that describes what happens with different videos. So the, the way we, we do it is that basically we have these JSON values, we encode them as types and then use uh, the union type unification and the union type unification is very similar to, to normal unification, except that first, the, there are no, no variable references that can cause occurs check to fail here. So because the, the input initially is basically uh, the static term with, without variables, but whenever two terms clash, we say that there is a union of possibilities there in this place in the term. So th th those for you who, who know how unification works, it's not actually unification, because normally for unification when there is a clash, it's basically a failure. We don't, we, we don't recover from it. Here it's opposite effect. We don't have variables, 
But whenever we would have a failure, we say, oh, there is more than one possibility. And when we have unions, we use some intelligent joining to preserve this fact that the type can be nullable or, or not. So we can treat the, the, the types as refinements. And nicely, we can do it without swelling types too much. So actually, usually, the, the JSON autotype generates a shorter description of what is on the input than the input itself. And actually, I already got uh, queries from C Sharp community, from uh, OCaml community, and from Java programmers that it would be good to, to run this JSON autotype and generate code in their language for parsing the inputs. Obviously, there is demand. Uh, unfortunately, I was so far not, I, I didn't really have that much time to actually finish this part of work, but at least Haskell part of JSON Autotype is rock solid. So it's version 101 is automatically tested. I don't see any, any bugs reported anymore. And uh, yeah, I, I think the initial experience with open source there, as soon as I put it on GitHub, within two hours, I got a first issue and it was rather embarrassing. <laughs> So yeah, so now I'm, I'm happy I don't get any issues. So I, I hope if somebody uses it, they, they don't yet report success story, which is a disappointment, but at least it doesn't break. So uh, an example application was uh, during International Conference of Functional Programming, people present the awards to the, the, the coolest hacker teams from, from all the world that compete approximately one and a half month earlier for 24 up to 72 hours. So upper time limit is 72 hours, 24 is lightning division to write a program that uh, usually it's some kind of game. So performs best in a certain kind of game. This year it was also a game, but all the descriptions were in JSON. So when the contest started, they basically put, I think, 90, something like this, example files on the web as test cases. And normally, the first few hours, people waste, you know, writing the parsers, making sure that it's the, the game environment is simulated correctly and so on. I didn't take part, but I was curious about it, how long to estimate how long it would take me. So I ran JSON and Autodyke. Then I thought, uh, maybe I should have better names for these data structures. And in total, I spent five minutes on the issue of getting the data in, which I'm very happy with. If I would not be a picky about variable names, that would be literally five seconds, plus one minute for downloading the sample files. And maybe a few more minutes for, for reading the description. It took me about one hour initially to, to like, consider all the consequences of the description of the instructions for the task. So that's a good start. Uh, then there is a company called Transcriptic. So basically they, they have the JSON description of the biological experiments that you can feed them, you can pay them for execution and then somebody in the wet lab makes sure that all the steps of the reaction are followed and that you get end products. So you send the protocol. Some of these protocols are basically books. You, you buy a book, like RNA purification protocols, such a big book that tells you which, which reagent to choose, in which conditions, and what is the exact ratio of this reagent to water and what is probably the good way to check that your company that provides you the reagent uh, provides it of high quality. So may maybe it's not like, you know, you lick the, the bottom of the tube. Usually it's safer nowadays. Uh, there's all biosafety, you know. Now it's yeah, it's like submerging a piece of paper in, in the probe, in the sample or something like that. It, it's, it's crazy how you do it, but it's not not unsafe anymore. 
So for the protocol, you basically mark the steps that they allow. It's usually mixing different substances. It's uh, 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 centrifuging them. It's mass spec. Against all odds, it's very, very, very uh, work intensive. If you do it as postdoc or pre-doc, I did it a little bit only. I know people that did it for a long time. So if you have a protocol and you have a reproducible way to do it, paying 300 along with this JSON request is like, oh, it's so cheap. I mean, it's cheaper than PhD student. Like, you know, really, <laughs> you need to train them, yeah? So they don't, for example, put their own skin by accident into sample. Certain samples are, are killed totally when you just touch them or you breathe on them. You know. So it's very good. And uh, the, the, the just API descriptions that I downloaded, that was few megabytes of documents. Some of the fragments, the, these are just examples of the protocols. Some of the fragments are well described on, on documentation. So initially I thought maybe that's so simple or so, so like apparent, you can just take it, pick it from documentation. No, no. Documentation is mutually inconsistent if you copy and paste examples from documentation and examples from the other things. Uh, JSON Autotype will, will show you that there are ors in the places where they shouldn't. So what I did is basically pre-filter it, so I, I run the JSON autotype on it, and then I checked where there are these unions that should not happen. So for example, if you have a protocol, you should not have a choice between, you know, water and centrifugation, because water is not a protocol, unfortunately. So I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but not very much. Obviously, they, during the development, they themselves, they didn't check, they didn't type check their own examples and schemas, so they are a bit, so it's not like everything would be tested with auto spec and H spec and here documents always are executed to check what is the output. And in the large project like this, because it's, it's basically a startup company that just wants to provide the, the service of biological experiment execution, that's a problem. So there is a big team of programmers that tries to sanitize it and because they generate a new code faster than they sanitize the old one, you can expect that it, it's not enough. So yeah, there was also another issue. Many people use dependent records in the JSON. So basically there is always this one field that tells you what type of of record you have or what type of object you have. And JSON Autotype doesn't yet handle it. It will have to handle it though. So I will add it. And Twitter API, of course, everybody who, who read the uh, Joel Gross book, there is of course this big, big example of on, on YouTube videos and Twitter API and it should be simple. So it is simple. You just download one example. You just register with the secret and the API key and you download one example from Twitter and you run JSON autotype and you feel like you've just passed it and you check that it's right. And if you write a program, it should work on the future versions of Twitter API because without any problems, or at least warn you when the schema of the JSON changes. So then I notice maybe we need more than this. So maybe it would be nice for JSON Autotype to first tell you that there is a similar library that already handles this API or this, this data. And the second, it would be nice to wrap the, the, the requests for the API. So that would be my next step. Because obviously for large APIs that you have like hundreds of endpoints, I already, uh, played with basically downloading the data from different endpoints and then running automatically JSON autotype on them. But it would be even nicer to wrap this process entirely. And of course people also, besides the support for other languages, people ask me for date and hex format support. 
uh, it's probably good if I start generating type mismatch errors for Ethon to get better error messages. But strangely, no user complained <laughs> about it so far. So, and my personal challenge, if you, if you are using any, any kind of software to parse a lot of data, then the, the, there is this first discovery stage. So you spend quite a lot of time just finding how to parse it. There are there libraries to parse it, and which of them is the best, and is it beautiful soup in the case of Pythoners? Is it one or the other of the, is it R to Parsec or Parsec-based HTML parser for, for Haskell users? It, it really depends, yeah? So my challenge is to discover a way to like make this whole phase automatable. So you just put a set of input files in the directory and you run your program and you get everything passed and you automatically install all libraries that are needed for it and you can start processing the data. That would ease a lot of our analysis tasks because my friends told me that they spend as much as 90% of time actually getting the data in and trying to sanitize it. That, that's already an issue. And if you doubt it, you can refer to Digital Web Analytics Meetup, for example, any other data science meetups in Singapore. Any questions? Yes. Uh, like for applications, uh, web applications, FTP, which require like very, very, very short latency. Yes. And like using Haskell, is it like a roadblock because you need to do all this because there are like ways in which you don't need to. Quite the opposite. So Haskell compilers have went a long way for the, particularly for the past 10 years. So you have, you see Haskell often challenging naive implementations in, in lower level languages like C or Fortran. And in case of web development, it certainly has a good chance to be much faster than, than, than uncompiled at least PHP, Python, and Ruby. I mean bytecode, a lot, lot faster. What kind of data do you stream? So it's the easy data, biological data again. Uh, it's like electronic program doing data. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are bringing like, uh, uh, there are already companies in the US and everywhere which are doing ECG streaming, live ECG streaming in your web app. So like your doctor can look at your ECG in the hospital if you're, let's say, having a heart problem at home and you know, things mm -hmm. like this. So we're doing, trying to do the same thing for brain data as well. So mm -hmm. people with epilepsy, they, they get attacks and then their correlation in the brain waves to track it at that particular time is very important. Uh, so uh, the, the latency is, is very critical there. Uh, I would say uh, the answer, you are right, is technology. So I would not use the HTTP. I would use or, or the naive HTTP, like I would not serve the HTML request each time that you get uh, uh, one more second of ECG data. You, you use web sockets. Mm -hmm. yeah, so no web RTC. Like, like, it can it can be, but then you need to use a web RTC or, or web sockets, not not you know naive yeah. HTTP request. And there is web socket support in Haskell, of course. So there should be no problem with it. And in the case of Haskell, if you have very, very small, small amount of data, like for ECG each time, then actually garbage collection should give you like optimum performance because it will be probably mostly all the time in cache. So you, you should have very, very 
pre predictable soft real time or maybe even hard real time behavior. And it's it's interest what, what kind of technology do we use for example for that? So we're using a JavaScript library that is uh, uh, called PCHR, P D E C H K R D. Uh, what a license for that and uh, and we are having a lot of problems. We initially used uh, D3.js because it gave us nice visualizations but it performed very poorly on the frames per second. Uh, we needed a minimum of 20 frames per, sec per second and it was giving us maybe 8 or 9. Then we used PCHR which stripped away the fancy visualization but uh, at least gave us like the acceptable frames per second. Uh, so uh, that's, that's what we're using right now. But it's all on the client side, right? Yeah. So uh, of course I'm saying yeah. um, like also what, what would you use to stream the data or what would you use uh, to implement an so API server or whatever? Yeah, uh, right now we, we just like uh, uh, working with I mean, we're working with real patient data, but it's already stored in the cloud, and we're just like using an API to pull request, and, and, and just like, so right now we're not streaming the data to a database from the patient side. We, we, we still to build that. We only build the, this part where we already, we, are, we already have database, which is stored in the cloud, and we have a API which is written in Python, and uh, that basically, uh, you know, front end calls that API to get. It's know. not real time. Uh, no, for now, uh, the real time it will be, it will be, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, so, so, so trying to explore, you know, what we could potentially use to make it, yeah. But again, the challenge was, first of all, to be able to get many frames per second. Yeah. And that's the first step. Yeah. So now we've achieved that. Now the next thing is to, you know, how do you, so the one part of the pipeline is done, you know, let's say like the cloud is your middle, middle man and, and then the, there's a front end and a back end. Yeah. Back end is the patient which is producing the data and then there's a, way to stream it real time to the cloud. And then the front end, which is like APIs pulling and passing it on to the front end. So this part is done, but this part is, is a question mark right now. Yeah, because so like HTTP itself won't fit for this kind of communication because you have to, it's backend that initiates passing the information, right? Mm -hmm. So otherwise you just have to pull your request from, from Yeah, the so right now we're doing caching also because, uh, because we can't pull that fast. Yeah. So that's another aspect of what we, we, yeah, we have to do. Like, uh, case for flat process to even, like, we have this kind of similar issues with radio changing information, like charting and how you draw on this. So, like, there's, there's no way uh, on HTTP to do it because, like, you have to read, for example, read all the yeah. the server. And as your client, client grows, there'll be, like, a huge, massive impact on your back end load. So, like, you won't handle Yeah, and, and the other thing is we even want to do away with the caching part because, uh, I mean, it's, we can't, uh, ca caching is not real time, you know, like we want real time, like perfect real time yeah. communication, you know, but so, uh, but at least frames per second part again, as I said, like those problems that we initially started with the sort, now, you know, like if you go backwards, you try yeah. to solve other pieces of the puzzle. Yeah. So your frames per second limitation, I mean, you said you changed the library, but the front end. Yes. So is that an issue with the front end job manipulation or is it an issue with processing of the input stream? Uh, I think it was more of an issue with the processing of the input stream. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to second what uh, Kyle already said. Like if you would for example use something like like Python mm -hmm. or, or Ruby mm -hmm. on, on the back end. Something like C++ 